Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're looking at something new from a company that's very, very popular, very, very familiar with everybody here that I know watches this channel. Uh, it feels like we were just reviewing their first castable resin and we're already back with their next one, their V2. And that resin is from Soraya. Soraya's first casting resin, this purple stuff, uh, this one was really well reviewed by us. It, it handles exceptionally well in the printing and the casting. It is a little bit temperamental in the way that you have to post-process it, but it's not impossible and we've gotten really, really successful results with it, as well as many of you out there that we know. The one tricky thing with the purple Soraya cast is the post-processing. You have to have an oxygen barrier, which is typically done with glycerin or water or something in a clear container during your post-UV processing. This is because some resins, in the presence of oxygen, if they're just, you know, sitting out in the open, they won't cure properly. So you need to have something to block that oxygen and allow, but still allow the UV light to get to it so that it can actually uh, cure properly. If you don't, what happens is a reaction between the uncured resin and the investment powder that you're putting around the castable resin and this creates a surface texture. It looks kind of like an orange peel, or it could just look like craters and it's pretty bad. But we're not here to talk about the purple one because Soraya has come up with a new one. Their Soraya Castable True Blue. And they were kind enough to send us a bottle to test. And full disclosure, we had some pre-production formulations that we gave feedback on. So in some small way, we were kind of involved with the development of this. This has not changed my opinion about the resin being involved at any stage. Uh, these, all of these results are very factual, very results-based. So to start our testing, we first started on the Prusa SL1S, which is pretty typical for us, where we ran at a 0.5 millimeter layer height using the resin calibration program that is built into the machine. We got pretty promising results across the board, starting at three and a half seconds, per layer up to seven and a half seconds with a 30 second base. All of the prints came out really, really well. The three and a half second looked great, while the seven and a half second showed quite a bit of evidence of over curing in some of the finer details. So after the calibration, I moved on to printing some more jewelry based models, thinking that this was going to be a piece of cake. At three and a half seconds with supports, uh, none of the prints actually came out. They all invariably just fell off. There wasn't enough strength there, no problem. So after that, I moved on to five seconds, which showed a lot more promise, further improvement at seven seconds. Some of the models would print perfectly, while some would just be an absolutely horrible mess, which oddly is always different depending on the model. Uh, when I would run one print, it would come out horrible, the others would turn out great. Then I'd rerun the exact same print, those other models would turn out horrible, and the one that failed would be great. So it was kind of mixed results there. I still don't really have a perfect explanation as to why this happened. Um, maybe it has something to do with Prusa and their resin vats still using generic FEP foils uh, versus some of the Elgu or well, pretty much any printer these days can get PFA or NFEP. There's a, about a 30% difference in how much sticking power these resins have to PFA versus generic FEP. However, I'm not sure if that's a big enough difference to make this much of an impact. Anyway, after getting really mixed results with the SL1S, I moved on to our Mars 3, which had quite a bit of improvement actually. But I would still say I was having some print trouble. The issues presented like layer separation and shifting rather than a total mess on the Mars 3 versus the SL1S. This might have had to do something with the tilting tank of the SL1S versus the Mars 3, which just kind of raises up and down to separate. So it might have been a little bit less uh, traumatic on those layer separations. Now something that we have to bear in mind is that I was testing this resin without any real understanding of what the characteristics were uh, beforehand and I certainly had no official print profile so I'm hoping that by the time this video comes out there will be an official print profile from Soraya and there will be no printing issues whatsoever for you guys the consumers. So regarding the post-processing as mentioned at the beginning of the video I did try multiple methods. I defaulted to the original purple Soraya cast method, which was washing in ethyl alcohol, drying with warm air, then submerging in glycerin for 30 minutes and a UV cure. And this worked phenomenally well. Our casting results with those particular models were absolutely awesome. 
From there, I started to work back and try to figure out, you know, does 15 minutes in glycerin work? 10, 5, do I need to do any post-UV processing at all? And I can happily say that uh, all of the results turned out phenomenally well. So let's talk more about the casting now. It seems like Soraya is aiming this resin to people who are newer to casting. In other words, there's, it's, it's much easier to get a good cast, regardless of what you're actually casting. And I can safely say that that is very true, because we were getting amazing results with ultra small jewelry, and I, at the time, had a, a client who wanted me to help, help them repair a trophy. This arm weighed a grand total of 200 grams of solid bronze. It was one inch, or 25 millimeters, at its widest, and about seven inches long, or 175 millimeters, which is really, really big. It's a very heavy model. And that casting turned out exceptionally well. I just want to make a quick note here that the photo that you're seeing here is actually, the resin is gray. This was the pre-test resin solution. They have since changed it, obviously, to blue and true blue, but our test resin was actually gray. The formulation has not changed. I just want to be very clear about that. We did see a little bit of flashing across the fingers, but nothing that wasn't easily just taken off with a file. And the best part, I think, about all of this is that I was able to do these with a normal burnout cycle. In other words, I used r and plastic cast mixed at the 40 to 100 ratio. We didn't use any boric acid. The burnout cycle lasted 12 hours and then it was cast at 2020 Fahrenheit silicon bronze. So it was basically another Tuesday for me. I, I didn't have to do anything special to make this resin work. So let's take a look at some of these prints and the castings. Something to bear in mind if you're new to this channel is that we print the exact same models for every single resin test because we want to have empirical evidence. A way of saying, you know, this model compared to the casting, this is great. And we can test that across every single resin that we try to say that, you know, this resin is actually better or worse. So let's take a look at these casts and the resin prints. So regarding the skulls, I had quite a lot of trouble getting good prints, and it seems to be a different issue pretty much everywhere. Uh, this one is by far one of the best. There's just a little bit of the jaw that didn't quite work out. This one, uh, the jaw didn't work out, and the back. This is a good show of some of the print issues that we had. They just, the, the, the supports need to be thicker, I think. I was using 0.4 millimeter heads. Uh, I believe they need to go up to 0.5 or 0.6 even with really deep head penetration because we're just not able to get those supports to connect very well. Once you get past the printing and you get a decent model, the casting is just phenomenal. Like there's no hint of surface texture issues anywhere that there shouldn't be. All of the details come out awesome, regardless of how thick or thin they are. I don't actually have a resin print of this one. This was the only one that we actually got and ended up casting. All of the prongs turned out phenomenally well, with all the holes in the stone, in the stone settings turning out uh, really, really well in this one. This has been a problem area in some resins. And we also typically see some surface texture issues down here on other resins as well. Moving on to a heavier piece of jewelry, this is a round signet ring. This one was one of the, the best and easiest to actually print. I got multiples of that one. And they all turned out awesome. Usually what we see is a little bit of surface texture down here, and you can actually see just the, the slightest bit. But from what exactly that is, I'm not sure, because it's not on the other side. And uh, I, I mean, it, it's so shallow, it'll just buff right off. You won't even need to use sanding for that. Then there was this tiny little engagement ring, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I actually cast one of the bad ones. It had a bit of a layer shift there on the prongs where it shouldn't be, so it looks a little bit funny, um, but it's still, you know, it, it, we're getting a representation of how well it casts, and the prongs are all there. Exactly what I put in is what I got out, which is very, very important. So overall, I'm very pleased with that. This is definitely the smallest piece that we have and I'm very pleased with how it turned out. And then there's one, this is the one that turned out by far the worst in terms of printing. This is a pave setting ring. And you can actually see a lot of the stone settings are filled in. 
where they shouldn't be because of overexposure. This is what I was saying about we need to dial in that print profile very accurately because if we want to get all of those little holes to be printed properly and not filled in, then we need to not be overexposing, but we can't underexpose so much that all the supports don't work. So again, we just need to work on some of those print profiles, but it's phenomenally good printing quality. It's very, very, very close as it is right now. And I would expect to see perfect results with this one as well because of some of the results of the other prints. So in summary, Soraya Cast True Blue is overall living up to Soraya's claims of making this a much easier entry castable resin. It's able to cast heavy objects with a much easier post-processing. Compared to the purple, I do think it's marginally harder to do the printing, but again, we, we just need to get that print profile tuned in perfectly. I really believe that this is a awesome, a great step in the right direction for Soraya and you guys, the consumers, pro or amateur, are going to be able to benefit from this exceptionally well. So that's all for this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this kind of content and you want to help support our channel, check out the link below where we actually have an affiliate link with Soraya and you can get your hands on a bottle of the Castable True Blue as well as help our channel out a little bit. Check out our membership program where you have access to me on a more one-on-one -on -one basis through our Discord channel where we can set up a call, diagnose all of your printing problems, uh, casting problems, get you some tool recommendations, whatever you need, uh, we'll be there to help you out. So I will see you guys in the next video.